examples, and uh, here are a couple of them that I thought were funny. Uh, so this new, you know, new wife uh, is coming in, first time, a whole family's over for dinner, and she's preparing, and they, she takes this big pot roast and cuts the ends off, and slices the ends off, and puts those in a separate pan, and puts it in. And her grandmother was there, and she's like, Grandma, I, I actually, I, I've always wondered why do you do this? Why do you cut the ends off of the pot roast before putting it in the oven? Uh, is it like a flavor thing or something? And she's just like, no, when I was growing up, the pan was just too small that I would put the pot roast in, so I had to cut the ends off. She's like, oh, so I, I cut them off for no reason? She's like, I guess so. Uh, another, another one we shared, they were at uh, Thanksgiving, and they put the, you know, put the turkey in the oven, and up next to the turkey, she put like this big, you know, heavy basin of water in there too. And her mom is coming in saying, why, why are you putting water in there? And she's just like, mom, you always did that. I was doing that because I thought it like added moisture or something. She's like, no, I did it because the oven was uneven and I had to put something heavy on the other side of it to even it out. Uh, and another, another girl was sharing that she put a dish pan upside down on the top of the turkey. And when her mom was like, why are you doing that? She's like, I thought, I thought that's like what you did. Like, I always saw you do that. She's like, yeah, we had cats that would always like eat the turkey and might have to cover it with something. You know, there are things that we can easily misinterpret. All right, that we, we saw it with our own eyes, so we're like, oh, there must be, there must be a reason for this. And we can miss the reason. Now, the disciples, this is exactly what they are doing with Jesus. They are, they have seen Jesus face to face. They have shook his hand. It was not at the time of Corona. Uh, they shook his hand. They hugged him. They kissed him. Uh, they, they see this physical man, this, this person in front of them, healing people, you know, rescuing people that are demon-possessed. And they, they go from crazy people to normal people. Like, they're seeing this physically happen. And they were assuming the kingdom of God was more physical than it actually was. It, it's reasonable. Like, again, like what, what they thought is not, like, crazy. It's reasonable. All right, just as, like, yeah, I guess you cut off the ends because, you know, it brings more flavor or something. Like, they saw that. They just didn't fully understand its meaning. They missed the spiritual aspect of the kingdom. This comes to a major head here in this passage. All right, and we're in Matthew chapter 26. This is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. We are getting ready to walk there. We finished up uh, Pastor Jason last week, shared about like Jesus at this, this last supper. He, he washed their feet, which was something really unique. Why would the rabbi wash the feet of his followers? Why would the teacher wash the feet of his disciples? And, and yet he does. He's explaining that he is the servant, uh, the servant king. And then they take communion, uh, that they take the Lord's Supper. This is my body that's going to be broken for you. This is my new covenant in my blood. And they're hearing this, but again, they, they didn't fully understand what was about to happen to Jesus. And this, you know, again, we start seeing it right here, Matthew chapter 26, verse 31. Jesus said to them, you will all fall away because of me this very night. For it is written, I will strike down the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go ahead of you to Galilee. But Peter said to him, even though all these fools might fall away, although all these God may fall away because of you, I will never fall away. Jesus said to him, truly I say to you, this very night before a rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, Jesus, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing too. Alright, so Jesus calls the shot here. He's saying, listen, I want to make sure you understand what's about to happen. There is going to be a scattering of them. The shepherd is going to be struck down. Alright, and even though, and, and Peter wants to jump in there. This is Peter's tendency, what we've been seeing all throughout the Gospels, is Peter 
speaks first. He jumps out first. He is excited. He is led with emotion. Uh, and his emotion right here is, you know, to really kind of this, this man up. This he is he is blustering. I mean, he is saying, even if everybody leaves you, not me. I will follow you even until death. All right, and it's the mentality. Guys have this mentality like, oh, if somebody tries to hurt my family, oh man. If somebody comes after my family, they're gonna die. You know, like if somebody comes after me, I got a, I got a little bit slug, I got a cult, and like we, we talk big. And then when it's like, hey, can you do the dishes for the family? I'm like, oh, I just sat down. So you want to die for the family, but not the dishes for the family. And that's kind of, so I fall somewhere. But we, we have this emotional connection that we would, we would go to battle, we would fight for what we believe in, and that is Peter. Peter is here in this emotional state of he, and he really believes this, and he's not lying. He really believes he would go to the point of death. Uh, but it's interesting what Jesus actually calls him to. What he actually calls him to, we get Matthew 26, and here's now verse 36. Then Jesus came with them to a place called Gethsemane. It's just like an olive, a garden of olive trees. All right? And he said to his disciple, sit here while I go over there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and began to be grieved and distressed. And he said to them, my soul is deeply grieved to the point of death. Remain here and keep watch with me. So he grabs Peter, James, and John. This is the same little inner circle that he grabbed a few, I don't know how far away it is time for our timeline. It was a few weeks ago when we were preaching on the transfiguration. I'm sure it was probably a few months. All right, that the Mount of Transfiguration, all right, that he grabs Peter, James, and John. He says, I'm going to show you a little bit more than I show everybody else. I'm going to reveal to you a little bit more. I have, I have big, big things for you, Peter, James, and John. All right? and, and I have big, big plans. Peter ends up really leading this movement uh, immediately after Jesus. John is the longest lasting uh, disciple. Uh, James is actually the first disciple to die. There's people that died before James, but James is the first disciple of Jesus uh, to die. All right? So he has these kind of big Big plans for Peter, James, and John. He once again, pulls this inner circle aside and, and he asks him something specific. He says, hey guys, can you, can you watch with me? Can, can, you, can you keep watch with me? He's grieved. He's distraught. I, I'm thinking through, and I kind of try to just read around, search, have they ever seen Jesus like this? Have they ever seen Jesus act like this? And in every which way, he is, he's concerned, he's grieved, or he's distressed. I don't see anywhere else where those words are describing Jesus. This is odd. You know, they should have looked at this, and, and it's kind of one of those things like, when Jesus kind of seems scared, that's when you should be scared. You know, like, if you ever see me running, you better start running, all right? Something's chasing me, okay? If I'm running, it's because something's after me, and all I gotta do, I don't have to outrun that, I just have to outrun you, all right? When, when, they, when Jesus looks distressed, when he looks grieved, what does that tell you about how you should be feeling? Jesus is asked here to keep watch with him, literally means stay awake, all right? That's what the word means, stay awake with I, I've had to ask people to do that to me in the past. It's usually my wife. And my wife is great at many, many things. She is not good at staying awake. When I'm like driving from when I was a youth pastor, and you're driving back to all, every youth of that seems to be some kind of all night in Orlando. And I'm driving back at 6 a.m. in the morning, and I'm trying to drive to a ski trip and save money by not having to stay an extra night in the hotel. So it's 7 a.m. in the morning, and I'm driving. I'm like, I need someone to stay awake. You've got to talk to me. You've got to play games with me. You've got to do so I'm just saying that you've got to stay awake. Your job is to keep me awake. You've got to be staring at my eyes. And if those close, you got to shake me awake fast. Their job is to keep me awake. Amanda, not good at this job. Amanda's not good at this job. She can, she can literally fall asleep anywhere, in any position. 
position at any time. Right now, if I told her, fall asleep right now, like if this was really like an illustration, I'd be like, lay down, fall asleep right now. She can do it. She can do it. So Jesus is asking his disciples, can, can you watch with me? So think about like, you, there's, there's um, enemies are on the way, and you need to be keeping lookout. They're coming, we just don't know when. Keep lookout. You get the person on the wall to keep watch. That's where this word's coming from. All right, so this is what he's asking you. So not only do they see Jesus acting in a way they've never really seen him act before. Second, he asks them something really specific. Will you watch out with me? Will you keep watch with me? Jesus doesn't ask a ton of his disciples. But every time, I always say, any time he's asking a question, there's always, like, he, he, he's got some kind of lesson he's about to teach with that question. I don't think this is any difference. I think he needs them to keep awake because he's saying, I'm about to teach you something. And you need to see it. Okay? You need to see it to understand this lesson I'm about to teach you. And the, the lesson, you just got to keep your eyes open in order to see it. What's this lesson going to be? Let's find out. Verse 39. And he went a little beyond them, fell on his face, and prayed, saying, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass for me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples, and he found them sleeping, and said to Peter, So you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Now, we're not going to spend a ton of time in this particular passage, mainly because uh, last year we really dug into this in pieces. You can watch that, I guess. Um, we really dug into the link. Like, if you want to see more on this passage, go see it. Um, but what we're seeing here, I think this is an incredible prayer. Because of what he's praying, he knows he's about to go through the most difficult thing imaginable. Like anything we picture with the cross of how horrible and violent and painful it must be that pales in comparison to Jesus, the only perfect sinful person, sin, perfectly sinless perfect person, to, is going to become sin. This God is going to become sin personified. He's going to be separated. The Son is going to be separated from the Father for the first time in eternity. Like the, the, the hell that that must have been, that that would have been, is beyond our understanding. Jesus is standing at the precipice of jumping into the most disgusting vat of whatever the grossest stuff to you is. You know, puke and throw up and die again. The most disgusting, he's about to jump into that sin. He has been as far away from sin as the east is from the west. Jesus knows that the sins of the world are about to be put on him. And he's going to be breathing it in for the first time in his life as he pays for the sins of the world on the cross. When he's saying, may this cup pass for me, he's saying, yeah, no rational being would ever want to go through what I'm about to go through. But I'm not telling you what I want. I'm saying I'll do anything you ask me to. Even to the point of death. Even to the point of death on the cross. Even to the point of death on the cross where I become sin. Am I not my will be yours? And so when he comes up and he sees these, these men, Oh, he's mad. I'll go to you to the point of death. I'll fight by your side forever, Jesus. Get him, get him awake. Look, like you're saying you're about to go into battle. You're willing to go into battle with me? You're willing to fight all my enemies with me? You can't even stay awake. Wake up. All right, you need to keep watching and praying because now he's turned his attention. His first thing just keep watching with me. Now he's worried about them. Saying, if you're going to sleep during this, you can fall asleep during this. All right? If you can sleep during this, you can sleep during anything. And I'm worried about the temptation that you're about to face. Now, there's a lot of interpretations here of what he's referring to by temptation. And again, click this link if you want to see this on the So we're going to actually do that, Chuck. Um, <laughs> but needless to say, what I think it's saying more than anything, uh, what I think 
the best interpretation is here, is his concern that their faith is about to be tested as he is dead for three days. And they're going to sit there thinking, so it was all a sham? It was all a lie? What? What is this? Or he knows the test that their, their faith is about to endure. Not only over these next three days, but they, it's about to be them. We are, we, are 40, we are 43 days away from Jesus ascending into heaven and saying, Disciples, it's all you now. All right, I've been here three years, and we're now at the very end. I got my last few words I'm going to be saying to you. I got like a paragraph to go, all right, of teaching. And then it's your time to begin to make disciples and to begin to teach them all that I've commanded you. All right, so God's always going to be with them, but not in this physical form where you can interact and ask questions and talk to and see every single day. So he's worried about the temptation they're going to face. The spirit is willing, clearly. They, they, they talk a good game. The flesh is weak. In this moment of all moments, they can't even stay awake. All right? Let's look at one more passage and we'll bring some application on that before we conclude. In verse 42, he went away again a second time and prayed, saying, My father... If this cannot pass away unless I drink it, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. Paul oh, sweating. Eyes heavy. All right, they couldn't stay awake. All right, they couldn't stay awake in the midst of this. Some application. It is not easy to stay awake for the lessons. He was trying to teach them something here in the Garden of Gethsemane. And, you know, in the moment of, you know, arrest that we're about to see here, when he gets arrested, yeah, everyone's awake, everyone, everyone's alive. It's in these moments of, of prayer that Jesus wanted to teach his disciples how to pray this kind of intense, visceral, Painful prayer. A prayer that he's literally like bleeding his own blood. Alright, because of how intense he is praying. They, they cannot know at, at the face of ultimate persecution how you pray. Alright, because in that moment you're not praying something a little lighter, like Jesus the first time he was asked, Hey, Jesus, teach us to pray. I'd love to. Our Father, which is in heaven, how would be your name? Your Jesus. This is a, a nice prayer, a beautiful prayer, a, a great prayer of giving a great example, of praying like this. Let's say pray this exact prayer. Pray like this. All right, that we, we pray that for forgiveness, and we pray that we for, are able to forgive others. We pray for God to provide for us. These, these are prayers, and we, these are things that we're praying for right now. We're praying all the time for, yeah, God, please take care of my needs right now. All right, but then there's these moments where it is beyond our capability. Jesus is saying, this, is, this feels beyond me. I'm the God of the universe. And this moment feels big. This moment is tough. This moment feels impossible. And he's teaching them how to pray in that moment. He is showing them what to do. And they were, they were asleep, and I think it's actually really hard. And the kind of the mundane, what seemed like Praying in the garden, it seems kind of far from the course, Jesus. I think we've done this before. I think it can be hard to keep watch. It can be hard to keep watch in the door. Right now, we don't have the door. I bet you if there was like a little prayer meter to, uh, C.S. Lewis wrote this uh, book called Out of the Silent Planet. It was part of his science fiction trilogy that no one ever read and has not been made into a children's movie. Uh, and it's these, these Martians that thought everybody on earth was dead. Because centuries ago, they could hear the prayers to who they called like, oh, that's not my God. They, they heard the prayers to God centuries ago, but they haven't heard anything in centuries. They haven't heard anything recently. And it's just because the number, like, the, there was too much other just chatter that they couldn't hear, they could only hear prayers. And they, they weren't hearing anymore. 
And it was just kind of this little, like, you know, C.S. Lewis's little shot, like, not prank, but first posted. Uh, I like that. I like the, I can imagine this Barsha that only can hear prayers. Right now, all of a sudden, he's saying, oh, I think there might be life on that, that blue planet over there. All right, there might be life there. There's prayers happening. Because all of a sudden, enough gets taken away. Enough uncertainty comes, we start praying. We start praying. I, they didn't realize what was about to happen. And so we just slipped. I just slept through this. And honestly, this could go on long enough that I think we just kind of like, ugh, I guess this is the new normal. And we return back to being the silent black. All right, we can return back to that. It's not easy. To always stay awake and see the lessons that Jesus is trying to teach us. All right, and I think number two, many times the hardest part of following Christ is during the mundane and the ordinary. But He calls us to faithfulness. Let's not ignore that God, Jesus gave these three guys a direct command: Watch with me. They couldn't do it. They fell asleep. And, and I think a lot of times it's that whole just be faithful. Like, if you you ask me, like, you know, we got to go out, we got to go, you know, pump, we got to go out, we got to hurt some people. Okay, let's go. You know, like, you, you call me, you need me to go lift something, let's go. You need me to go help people, yeah, let's go. You ask me, like, you ask me something interesting, you ask me something cool, yeah, I'm in. But when Jesus asks them something kind of ordinary, like, hey, can you just keep awake? Like, uh, anybody can you know, then fall asleep. And, and I think sometimes what God is calling us to, to just be faithful, we kind of act like, ugh, anybody can do that. Anybody can do, you know, help with this little area of our church. Anybody could help with that little area. And so we act like it's not a big deal. Right? And here in this moment, what Christ is calling us to is faithfulness only. Now, ultimately, I think we get to fast forward a little bit. And we're going to get into the book of Acts here in a couple weeks and looking at like Peter continuing on after the Gospels. We're going to see that the disciples get the message. We see that they persevere. Uh, that in tough times, they persevere. They learn their lesson. They follow Jesus. And they told everyone about it. And now, you know, 2,000 plus years later, we are still hearing that message. All right, so they learned the lesson. There was a lesson that they learned, even though they fell asleep during it, Jesus woke them up enough uh, that they got the lesson, and they now persevere in difficult times that are about to come. Now let's make sure we finish out the story here. We're still a little bit on the setup, and the reaction is coming. All right, and he left them, and he went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing once more. He came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? This is almost impressive at this point. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hand of sinners. Get up, let's be going. Behold, the one who betrays me is at hand. Uh, I think this passage, I think, is one of dozens of passages that help us indicate that Jesus is fully in control and fully aware of what is going on here. Uh, there's a story of a missionary uh, that you know, is telling the story of Jesus. And, you know, he's been going through you know, all the stories of the Old Testament. He's getting to the crescendo here. And he's getting to the point where Jesus is now betrayed by Judas, crucified on the cross, dies for us, and raised from the dead. And at the end of this story, where he's finally expecting people to begin to say, Yes, I want to trust this Jesus, he has people come up to him and say, Can you tell me more about this, this Judas guy? And there's like, why do you want to know more about Judas? Why do you know about Judas? It's like, so you've been spending a few weeks here telling us how Jesus is God, right? Yeah, he's the Messiah, the most powerful being of all time. Yeah, and Judas deceived him. Judas tricked God? That's kind of what we want to do. Is, whoa, okay, stop, stop, stop. I must have cut out parts of the story. Because if you read, when you really read the scriptures for yourself, you see something. We see at the Last Supper, that he's saying, I'm going to take this bread, I'm going to dip it in the cup of the person who's about to betray me. And he puts it in front of people, and everyone's like, oh, not me, right? <laughs> Dips it in the cup of Judas, and Judas fills the sink, goes and runs out. Goes and betrays him, takes it to the seal. So, so, so it comes back. He's not even on the scene yet. When Jesus is standing up, he's like, okay, it's time. 
I'm about to be betrayed. I'm about to be betrayed. My betrayal is at hand. He knows exactly what's going on. This is what the scripture is being clear. That Jesus knows that a trap is about to be set. He is saying, a trap is coming. They're coming to see me. They're going to act like they're all front and they're going to come and arrest me. Wait, if you know all that, uh, let's go. And he's like, no, this is the plan. My plan is to get caught in the trap. My plan is, this is the fulfilled scriptures, as they'll say. This is the plan of God. All right? And that's what I'm being obedient. This is what I was praying about if you're paying attention. I was praying, may this come past me. I don't want to go through this, but I'm willing to, Lord. All right, no answer. That means I keep going forward. And here it is. Betrayal's coming. There's the bear trap. And I'm about to step it. It's going to hurt. It's not going to not hurt. It's going to hurt so bad. But it's not that he's getting tricked. And it's not that he's being deceived. He does this with his eyes open. And while he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, said Jesus, come up accompanied by a large crowd with swords and clubs who came from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now he who was betraying him gave them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he is the one. Seize him. Immediately Judas went to Jesus and said, Hail, Rabbi. And kissed him. Then Jesus said to him, Friend, do what you come for. And they came and laid hands on Jesus and seized him. I love what this one uh, commentator says that I like, but he says, so this deceitful wretch still addresses him as his master, though he was now serving his most implacable, placeable enemies. I and wishes him all peace and joy when he was going to deliver him into the hands of those that saw his life. And to cover it all, kissed him as a token of his friendship and sincerity. I love that deceitful wretch. Uh, when he points out something really interesting right after that, he says, in all of Scripture and the ancient Near East Jewish literature, so he says, I can't find any example of a disciple kissing his master, his rabbi. It would be very common for a rabbi to come to his disciples and like, you know, a little kiss on the head. Uh, you know, you do those little kiss. The master is the one that initiates. He is the one that is bestowing the blessing. And that is, it's, it's not just, it's not like it's a cultural root thing. It was just an earth. Just, I can't find an example. I can't find an example of a disciple kissing the master. I, I think this is, that kiss might be trying to explain like, yeah, I'm in charge now. I'm the one that's doing what I think is right. I, I, it's hard to get to the mindset of Judas. We don't get a ton of motive. All we get is these little moments of man filled with Satan. But if I were to put a motive on it as best as I can, he didn't think Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus wasn't doing the things he expected the Messiah to do. And that's true for all the disciples. Every disciple, you know, the zealot disciple is thinking like, yeah, I'm kind of waiting for, where's the army? This isn't enough to fight the Romans. You know, the, you know, people that are a little more on the religious side of things is like, yeah, a lot of enemies with like the religious folks. You think you'd be like trying to unite all the religious folks together. You know, like everyone had their own little expectation of the Messiah. You know, they clearly all saw that in a minute. They clearly all saw there was going to be some sort of physical kingdom that, you know, J Jerusalem is going to now be the center of a new empire. All right? But Judas went to the point where not only is he not living up to my expectation, this must mean I am determined that he is not the true Messiah. And I might as well get some. They want to they deceive him. I'll take 30, 30 pieces of silver. It's better than zero pieces of silver. Let's go. It's not even that much money. Let's go. All right? And, and he, maybe that just symbolizes the, you know, look at me, look at me. I'm the captain now. You know, I'm the master. I'm doing what I think is best. I look at all these people following me. All right? I wouldn't even been known. Like, name the 12 disciples. You could probably get about five or six people. <laughs> and Judas is like, you're going to know me. I'm not going to be one of just these little, 
God. And how does he do this? I don't understand how he Now, the other interesting thing that maybe you'll point out here too is Jesus. His response is, is friend. Jesus said, friend? Do what you want. Greek is, is definitely more of an expressive language than English. English is, especially American English, uh, we, we are precise with our words in the sense of uh, we don't, it's not like we have a ton of metaphor to our language. We're pretty straightforward in our communication. But because we're pretty straightforward in our communication, we, we limit a lot of our, our word choices. So we can say something like friend, and we need a lot of different things. I can say like, oh yeah, yeah, they're my friend. Like, does friend mean like best friend since childhood? You know everything about each other? Like, no, I mean, I work two people go away from them, and I, I know the last name. You know, like, <laughs> we can say friend or brother, but in Greek, there's two different words for friend. There is the, like, that friend that sticks close to the brother. The like, you know, I got you, bro. That brother. Friend, that close knit emotional connection friend. And then there's the this is my companion. Alright, this is someone, yeah, we, we travel, yeah, we travel with oh, well, we've done a couple, a couple work trips together, yeah. Alright, uh, this is it, it's stronger than acquaintance, but it, it's this idea of it's not an emotional friend. It's this uh, I've traveled with him. Yeah, they're my they're my they're what? Yeah, it's just this is my traveling companion. So that's the word is used. So don't think Jesus is not throwing super gay here. Uh, he, he's just saying, like, all right, all right, friend, do, do what you come to do. All right, he, he's showing his willing. Jesus is not suicidal, okay? Jesus is not, like, doing things and saying things, acting recklessly in order to get crucified. All right, Jesus isn't doing things like, we should rebel against Caesar. You know, he's not doing things that's going to get him crucified. He, what does he say here that's incriminating? Do what you come to do. He doesn't even say, arrest me. Arrest me. He's not, but he's not going to He just, do what you come to do. Whatever you're going to do, you're going to do. And kiss him, seize him. All right? This is where, and behold, one of those who were with Jesus reached and drew out a sword, struck the slave of the high priest, uh, who thought himself as the assistant high priest, but he was really just assistant. Of the slave ivory, cut his ear off, and then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place. All these who have come to take up the sword shall perish by the sword. Or do you think that I cannot appeal my father, and he will at once at my disposal more than twelve legions of angels? How then will the scriptures be fulfilled which say that it must happen? This way. Alright, just to give some additional background, John, the Apostle John informs us that this one disciple was Peter. Alright, Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't say Peter. Most people think the reason why they don't say Peter's name is when they were writing this, and you know, maybe Mark is writing this, some people think late, late 40s, but definitely by the early 50s. Uh, Luke is probably early 60s. Peter was still alive. Alright, and so they don't say Peter's name. Because Jesus does a good job here of kind of like, whoa, let's get everything back to normal. We also let Luke let us know that he puts the ear back on, like, hey, look, nothing's happened here. Look, no, no, his ears was chopped off. He puts his ear back on. That's a little miracle. He, he's protecting his disciples. Like, no one's going to jail. No one's going to be killed for attacking the high priest servant. All right, he doesn't, do, and they don't want to sell Peter out and like, whoa, Peter. We got records here of Peter assaulting an officer of the court. Uh, and so most people think that uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke don't mention his name, but by the time John is writing in the late 80s, Peter's dead. And so, like, I don't think Peter was there that. Uh, and so that's why that was known Peter. John also lets us know that the man who's here, he cut off his name, Thomas. Uh, so now, um, in here in this, in this moment, and this is strange. This is a weird, unique thing. Yeah, it fits Peter's character. Acting first, thinking later. All right, he he just reacts. But when we saw, we at least saw the bluster earlier. He's saying, "Yeah, I will fight to the point of death." All right, and, and there's another weird little detail that you can easily miss in Luke chapter. In Luke chapter 22, right before they're about to go to the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, 
there's this little mention. They said, Lord, look here, our two swords. All right? And he said to them, okay, that's enough. That's enough. And, and it's interesting. They didn't normally carry swords. Josephus tells us that it was actually very common for people to carry swords and go into Jerusalem, that all surrounding Jerusalem is tons and tons of uh, robbers and thieves. And so especially if you travel at night, it would be normal to have a sword. Apparently, this was not normal for them to carry swords, but they are they're getting ready to go into Jerusalem. They go to the Mount of Olives, or they go to uh, Gethsemane, which is below the Mount of Olives. Uh, and they show, like, look here, there's two swords. And, and Jesus' statement is not, leave that. Don't bring them. What are you thinking? Why are we bringing swords? His answer is also not, uh, listen, there are 12 of you. Why do I not see 12 swords here? All right? He looks at it and he says, okay, that's enough. And he goes on, I think I find it so interesting that Jesus is like, yeah, he's not really trying to protect himself. Otherwise, he'd say, let everybody get a sword. We got two hands. Don't we? Let's dual wield. All right? But he's not trying to go to battle, but he also knows he wants this lesson to take place. And he's kind of like, man, Jesus, that's what I just call the word sovereignty. It's like, how does Jesus allow something that he doesn't want and yet allows and is still going to teach us through? So he's not, he obviously doesn't want a battle, but he kind of wants this moment where they're going to use this sword to cut someone's ear off or something else, and Jesus can then go in and heal it and really reveal here in this moment that his kingdom is not a physical kingdom. And he tells Peter, don't, like, you know who I am, right? Say my name. I could call down 12 legions of angels. Like what, there's like 50 people here? All right, I can call down thousands of angels if I want to. All right? I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I don't need you. I don't need you to do this. And he goes and he sets everything right. He reveals at this moment that this kingdom is not a physical kingdom. Sure, if he's trying to build up a physical kingdom, he needs to start building up that army. What a great moment to kind of let the, this enemy that he's had kind of throw words back and forth at each other. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin. Finally, it's battle time. They were gonna, everyone's going to pick sides. And we're going to see who's that. No, that's not what Jesus is about. In fact, uh, oh, let me get that one second. That's not what he's about. All right, now, they misunderstood what the kingdom was. Again, they saw physical healing. They saw physical transformations. What they were missing was what Jesus was saying right after that. The reason why he would heal a blind person, he, he would point out and say, hey, this blind person can see better than all of you. He all saw that I am the Son of God and that I could heal him. You with eyes are way more blind than this guy. He would heal the person that was, that was lame, that had broken legs, broken backs, He's healing them, and he's saying, and your sins are forgiven. And people are freaking out. He says, it's hard to say. Your sins are forgiven. You can't prove that. Or stand up and walk. And this guy that was, you know, had these crippled little skinny legs, all of a sudden stands up, all right, you know, got thick legs, doing some squats, all right, and he's saying, now I proved that I am who I say I am. And I prove when I say your sins are forgiven, you can actually believe that. It's one thing to say, that when you die, you're going to go to heaven. That you'll live again. It's easy to say. I can say it. When you die, you're going to become a alien. I can say whatever I want. All right? But what Jesus did is say, when you die, you're going to spend an eternity in heaven. When Jesus died, he rose from the dead, beating sin and beating death. And then Peter pans into heaven, revealing that what he did proves what he said. Or what he does physically is simply just to reveal a deeper truth spiritually. And they, they missed it. They missed it. They missed that his death would have spiritual implications, that his arrest could have spiritual impact. Uh, and they misunderstood. And I think we do that to Scripture too. We can misunderstand Scripture. We can look at scriptures and we start applying it to like, we skip what it meant to the people back then and we try to jump right to what it means to us today. Uh, Wayne Bruto, uh, Dr. Theology himself, gives us a, a great little reminder in times like this. 
in a day when it is common for people to tell us how hard it is to interpret Scripture rightly, we would do well to remember that not once in the Gospel do we ever hear Jesus say something like this, I see how you crop a rose, the Scriptures are not very clear on this subject. Instead, whether he is speaking to scholars or untrained common people, his response always assumes that the blame for misunderstanding any teaching of Scripture is not to be placed on the Scriptures themselves, but on those who misunderstand or fail to accept those scriptures. When there is a misunderstanding of Scripture, when there is something difficult, it's because you're the idiot. Right? It's because you aren't going to interpret It's not the Scripture's fault. God reveals what he wants to reveal in Scripture. He purposely keeps some things vague, purposely hides some things, holds some things back to be revealed later. All right? But when we misinterpret Scripture, let's not start chalking it up to like, man, man, I think it's impossible to understand. We never want to treat Scripture like that. It's not easy to understand because then people come along and they act like, yeah, I can't understand this thing anymore. Put it off the stuff. No, it is meant to be understood. It can be understood. It's easy to misunderstand when we are, you know, when we try to just look at one little individual event and not look at the whole thing. When we read it with an agenda, when our first statement is like, I just want to apply this to me. No, our first goal should be, I want to make sure I understand what it meant to the people back then. All right, when we fight to understand, we usually will, and the few times we can't is our failing, not the scriptures. Just to conclude here as we get the application, Jesus said to the crowd, have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as you would against a robber? Every day I used to sit in the temple teaching and did not see me. But all this has taken place to fulfill the scriptures of the prophets, that all the disciples left him and fled. He makes sure he kind of gets on the record with all those people there, like 50 people there that are arrested, saying like, it's kind of weird that you could have arrested me any time when I was in the temple. I was just there the other day. Tossing tables, you didn't arrest me that day. All right, you, you didn't arrest me when I was teaching in the synagogues. I, I'm actually, I remember you. You were there. All right, you didn't arrest me then. What did I do between now and then? Okay, put it out there. Just put it out there. So, what are our lessons learned? The practical. The practical is we should look to the perfect one. Despite our sleepy moments, um, let us not get discouraged in the mundane. Let us not get discouraged that this race can seem really long sometimes. Uh, I know this past week felt like it was a decade. I, I saw the memes saying that like, you know, you know, man, that was, that was a long decade. I mean, I've lived through the 80s, 90s, 2000s, 2010, 2020, and March. All right, like the, it could seem like a long time. And in that, so did we accomplish 10 years worth of stuff for the kingdom in this week? Maybe we could have. Maybe we could have. So we, we should, there's this practical angle of we just look to the perfect one. Let's, we get to follow Jesus. We get to follow Jesus. When you ask me, like, really specifically, like, what should we do? I'm like, yeah, I don't know. Let's follow Jesus. And whether we live in communist China or we live in, you know, Corona America, like, we're going to follow Jesus. Like, we're going to follow Jesus. And that, it was true in the Middle Ages, and it's true now, and it's true in, you know, the Caribbean, and, and it's true in Africa. Like, we're going to follow Jesus. What does Jesus tell us to do? What are the commands of Christ? Let's do those. What does he say in his word? I'm going to pray. I'm going to reach out to Scripture. We're going to follow the perfect one. But now, theologically, I think there's even something deeper here, the spiritual application here. Jesus demonstrates the true nature of the kingdom. And, and again, I, I, I see this whole, like, I'm going to let you bring that sword because I know you're going to try to put someone's eye out with it. Like, he knows they're going to misuse it. And then he knows he can use that as this illustration to be crystal clear, absolutely crystal clear on what the kingdom is, that it is not a physical kingdom. He could have gotten out of that situation. He didn't. He wants them to know that the kingdom he is building is beyond this world. It does include this world, but it's beyond it. All right? There, there is a physical church here on this earth, but his kingdom is eternal, and there's a future far beyond anything that's going to last uh, here on this earth. 
he reveals in this moment the power that he has, that he has this very subtle little action of this ear gets chopped off, he takes it, he puts it back on, and it's back, no scar, all right? And as he puts it back on, in that moment, he reveals the power that he has. He's like, you get that I could take over the world, right? Like, you know I could take over the world. I could be the, the dictator of all dictators. Everyone could be underneath my footstool. I could literally prop my feet up with Caesar, bowing before me like, is this good? Is like, yep, actually, to the left a little bit, lower, perfect. Like, he could just, he could just be relaxing on Malta, just chilling, all right? He, he could have taken over the world. He doesn't, all right? He, he reveals in that moment that, like, man, I could make, I could set myself up for, like, maybe, like, I don't want that whole, like, take over the world thing. You know, I just want to live in a life of luxury. Jesus could have lived forever. Jesus, Jesus wouldn't have had to die, all right? A, there's no sin, so there'd be no reason for him to die. But what virus would ever dare infect the creator of the universe? Demons come before Jesus like Legion and shudder, like, please don't cast us away. Do you think any virus would, like, get into Jesus' system? You're like, you know what? I, not worth it. I'm out. Like, who would try to infect the one and only Son of God? Not possible. Jesus could have lived a happy, healthy life forever. And the things we fear right now, maybe death, maybe health, you know, we're, we're willing to sacrifice a lot when we think we won't be healthy. We're worried about money. We're worried about security. These are real things to worry about. But what does Jesus show us here? What does he tell us here? That Jesus shows us that he gave up all that stuff. He gave up his life. He gave up his health. He gave up, he didn't even pursue, but gave up any opportunity to be the wealthiest, most powerful, anything he wanted. He gave it all up. And what that, what that tells us is that what Jesus gave it up for must be better. That if Jesus is willing to set all this aside, death, health, money, security. He's, he looks at that and he says, this is better. We should take notice. We should be like, if Jesus is saying that, that that's not the hero all end all, what is he offering? Because he is offering an eternal kingdom. He is offering eternal riches. He is offering eternal blessing. He showed us what was more valuable. He showed us. So, you know, we're two weeks into this thing, and uh, I think we're going to be here a little bit longer. Uh, I, I know our prayer, I know our prayers maybe start resembling Jesus' prayer. God, may this cup pass from me. But make sure we add this second part of his prayer, not my will, but your will. Maybe God wants this to be going on a little bit longer. Maybe he wants it. Maybe he wants to teach us something, reveal us something in it. So let's pray. May this cup pass for me. Don't, don't hide what you want. I want this to be over. <laughs> I want to get back to not insanity. All right? I want that. I'm not going to be afraid to pray that. But I want to pray, not my will, but yours. Stay awake during this time. Look around. Keep watch during this. There might be things that God is revealing that we don't even realize. Maybe there's some things that we can do now that we couldn't do at other times. Maybe we shouldn't be trying to do, be as normal as possible. Maybe normal was a really terrible, terrible idea. Maybe what we called normal was a really terrible norm for the church. And we could say we could do things uh, differently. And when I say different, I want to replace that word with better. We pray differently. Actually, let's pray better. And we, we read, let's read the Bible differently. Let's read the Bible better. Love differently, maybe. Love better. Worship team, you might close this out with one, uh, one more song. That would be wonderful. Um, a good one. Uh, let's.